uh, tobacco is critically important to the economy. It is everything to these people. It drove how they think, how they do. It is the engine again. So we wanted to, uh, to look into how you transport this. But first, where does the tobacco go? The tobacco goes in this container right here, this barrel called a hogshead that John made here. Um, we got, there's, there's different ways to do this. One is you can simply roll it down the road, but this is a thousand pounds of tobacco. We wanted to investigate other ways that you can do this. And this is that way. Uh, it's called, we called it a hogshead carrier. And we got this from a guy named William Tatum who uh, wrote about it, wrote all about the tobacco pro process. And he was here in Virginia for at least 10 years. He finally published his little treatise in 1800 in England. So in there is this little diagram of this thing right here, right here. And this is our first attempt to do it here. There will surely be other other uh, alterations to it till we get it just right. Of course, the hog said is perfect. All right. <laughs> it's the carrier part that we're working on. Hey, wait. Hey, I know. <laughs> it's not your fault. We're all working here together. And, and Paul's going to teach me a, a lot of this because it appears that farmers did a lot of his part. Oof, but we'll get to that. First, we want to show a video a little bit about tobacco so that you can see the processes that are involved in that. All right, so first we have to plow the field here, and you can see that there. Then what we do is have to level it off, and that's me and Eli there leveling it off with a harrow. We raise the hills up, and in it we'll have to transplant tobacco. Sometimes the tobacco needs a little bit of water, so we get a little shot with the gourd dipper, and there we have a stand of tobacco there. Um, you know, you have to take the top off. That's what I'm doing right there, breaking it off. And of course, the breaking it off puts the energy towards the leaves, and with the leaves, we get these worms that you just saw. And now we have to cut it. We have to hang it up there on sticks. It starts as yellow, and it turns that golden beautiful brown. We tied it in the hands, and all those hands, thousands of those hands, are compressed into this hogshead right here. So um, that's how you do it. That's a little general bit about it here. John might share some more about the hogshead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the tobacco hogshead is the specific size container that the law says Virginians had to use to ship their tobacco to Great Britain during the colonial period. We continue to use it after independence. The whole advantage of the bellied shape of the cask, whether it's tobacco that you're shipping or something else, because casks were used for shipping pretty much everything that you care to think of, is that you can turn it on its side and roll it around, whether that's by hand or using the carrier that we've experimented with here. Now we're gonna show you a video that shows a bit more of the process of making the hog's head. Hi, I'm John Hallman, the master cooper here at Colony Williamsburg. Today we're going to be trussing a tobacco hogshead. Trussing is the process of bending a barrel into the bellied shape. Casks or barrel shaped containers were in one size or another used for the bulk shipment of pretty much everything that you care to think of. The advantage of the barrel as a package is that it's easy to move. You turn it on its side and roll it around. But the sizes for different commodities were regulated by law. In this case, again, we're dealing specifically with the size used to ship tobacco from Virginia to Great Britain in the 18th century. This container, uh, when finished and packed full, would typically hold about a half a ton of cured leaf tobacco. By the early 1770s, Virginia is exporting from 70 to 80,000 hogsheads of tobacco a year back to Great Britain. We're now ready to truss. And the first thing I have to do is start a fire in our cresset or heat source here. It's nice and uniformly warm all the way through. And now it's time to start the process of bending it by driving on the hoops. We're driving the overrunner, which is the first hoop, the hoop that represents the diameter at the widest point of the container all the way down to the ground, and that really begins the process of pulling the cask into the bellied shape. 
keep repeating that with a series of gradually smaller and smaller hoops until it's pulled all the way together. As we start driving the truss hoops on, the, the difference in diameter from one hoop to the next is relatively small, perhaps only a half inch. At this point, we've completed the process of trussing the tobacco hogshead that is having bent it into shape. So now it's back over the fire and we're just driving the temperature up, getting the wood nice and hot. And that has the effect of setting the staves to shape. From this point on, uh, we have to finish off the woodworking on the container. We'll level off both ends of the cask, cut grooves around the inside of each end for the heads, the top and bottom to fit into, make the heads, put them into place, and then when all that woodwork is done, we'll make a set of permanent hoops to fit the finished container that will replace one by one the construction hoops that we currently have on it. The permanent hoops traditionally could be made out of either wood or metal, but iron is what we're gonna go with in this case. So once the Cooper's work was done in manufacturing the hogshead, it was ready to be packed with tobacco and transported to the inspection warehouse. Before we move on any further, do we have any questions at this point? Yes, gentlemen, thanks so much. This is Trades Tuesday producer Bill Pavlak, and I'll be giving voice to the questions our viewers send in today. Uh, the question is, where would the Coopers be uh, doing this work? Are they on a farm or a plantation, or are they in, in a shop in a city like Williamsburg? In most cases, Coopers are gonna work where the product going into the container is made. Uh, one of the, the key things when we talk about these containers is the sizes for different commodities were set by law. So aside from the place where the product going inside was produced, there's really no need for the empty packaging. So in the case of tobacco hogsheads, that normally means Coopers working on the plantations where the tobacco is being grown. Uh, that could be free or enslaved labor here in Virginia in the 18th century. We see both involved in the process. Uh, certainly wealthy plantation owners are going to have their own staff of coopers. For a small farmer who's only growing enough tobacco to pack a single hogshead, they might rent the labor of a cooper from a wealthier neighbor or arrange to buy a hogshead in which to pack the tobacco from that wealthier planter. But, um, yeah. Other questions? No, I, I think just maybe you, what about Paul for the wheelwrights? I mean, yeah. how, how, now, do how do you figure it? into this? Well, you know, the funny thing, I was going to ask a question if I can. Sure. Hawks has a weird name. Where does that come from? We don't know. There you go, we, folks. Have a sure. nice day. <laughs> no, we also don't know where the term barrel comes from, for that matter. So it's just, oh, yeah. it's just an, an ancient trade with a lot of old terminology. Yep. But so where the question do you fit is, in? where do wheelwrights fit in? And the answer is, they don't. They have nothing to do with this. Now, that begs the question, why am I involved in this? I don't know. It asked me, and I figured, <laughs> hey, why not? So we had that challenge come down, that gauntlet throw down of we need to be able to transport this hogshead of tobacco uh, based on that image from Tatum, as Ed talked about. So what I had to work with was that image, uh, as you could see on your screen. Uh, a few problems we have is we had a very short amount of time to take that image into something that is usable and still be able to train the horse. So in that rush, I uh, found a old pair of shafts. Shafts are the part that go alongside the horse to allow the vehicle to be pulled. So they stand right dead center, those two long pieces. And with there, I kind of rigged up uh, what would be very similar to what you'd have on a normal vehicle. The difference is the wheel is not a wheel, but it's the cargo itself. There's an axle running through it. It's actually a small pintle, uh, kind of a bolt, if you will, sticking out of the head of the barrel and into the shaft itself. Um, so my thought process was, what would a farmer do if he had spare parts around and he needed to be able to transport this out? Slap it together. So that is uh, part of the thought process there. I believe we have a video to show you. And Hi, I'm Paul Zlesnikar. I work here at the Wheelwright Shop, and I'd like to talk about our contribution to this project, which is a hogshead carrier. The hogshead itself made by our Cooper Shop. It's the barrel that's used to contain or hold uh, tobacco. Our contribution as vehicle builders is the part that actually makes this a vehicle. The shafts that go alongside the barrel, that the horse will stand right here in the center 
and allow the barrel to be pulled behind it. We also are building the fellies. Fellies are part of the wheel that make up the rim. These are carved out of wood, so chopped or sawn to shape. These happen to be sawn. And these will fit around the barrel uh, and spiked in place. These nails were made by our blacksmith shop. In a normal wheel, uh, each felly represents one section uh, that span two spokes. The template itself is applied to a board and then the sections are carved out, either by chopping or by sawing it out to shape. For this particular project, based on the 18th century sources, it looks like these fellies are done very much the same way. We'll dress the inside out with a tool called a compass plane. As you can see, it's got a curved uh, sole or bottom of the plane. So by running this along the surface of the inside, lifts up the high spots, and in this case, makes the surface nice and flat and 90 degrees of my reference side. The outside, is done in a similar manner, except with a different tool, of course. Here we're using a smoothing plane. So as you can see, a flat surface. Running this along the surface and doing the same thing. Now in this case, we're using yellow pine, which I happen to get from our carpenter's yard. It's a scrap piece they're using for building construction. But I figured that this type of vehicle was probably not using the high dollar uh, material, but rather using stuff like pine, which is a very cheap material. This will be the surface that's touching the ground. So we'll see how this works. This entire project is an experiment on our end and uh, the farmer's end. Historically, this would have been a one-shot deal, meaning a trip one way, but we intend to use this vehicle for programming throughout the historic area. So uh, only time will tell uh, how these will wear out. Now that was probably one of the best films you're going to see thus far. <laughs> that being said, does anybody have any questions to this point? Yeah, so you're, you're really, I, I think if we're understanding correctly, this is a single use vehicle. Is that right? Are there other single use vehicles? And then Cheryl also writes in a question, was the hogshead itself reused or is it you, you make this, you send it off and then that's it? Very often, whether it's with tobacco hogsheads or casks for other products, they're single use. The issue is the same one we deal with when it comes to most of our packaging today. It would cost more to send it back to be reused than it does to make a new one at the point of origin. Yeah, so, so yeah, very often they're just single use disposable containers. Disposable, like the cardboard box of the 21st century. So something to remember, this hogshead will go on a ship. It has to fit perfectly. That's why it's by regulation a certain size. Uh, this will go to a tobacconist who's a manufacturer of tobacco, and that person makes the product. So that all this comes off, and I can just imagine him burning it in Probably. his hearth, trying to stay warm in sunny England, which ain't <laughs> so sunny sometimes. Oh, also, um, you want to comment on the shafts? Like we figure that. Uh, this is a one-way trip, and that uh, just to, as Paul described, it's kind of cobbled together. They also used uh, hickory saplings and other yeah. stuff, and we think it's a one-way trip. Yeah, Tatum describes, Tatum, the author, the guy who drew that picture, uh, describes hickory saplings running that full span and creating shafts, uh, which we are going to do in the uh, Hogshead Roller Mark II. Stay tuned. Uh, but for this particular purposes, I think this worked actually rather well. Yeah, um, I think it's a good start. It's a good start. There you go. So uh, uh, a little bit about the uh, background. Okay, so this was a collaborative project here. Missing is a critical component with Coach and Livestock Department. Uh, Dan Hard, expert horseman, and Gunner the horse, uh, they had to be trained. Expert horse. Expert yes. horse, yeah. right. Uh, Gunner, he, he knows everything. He just had to become, it's not really trained, accustomed to this. Uh, and that's where we found out the uh, shafts are a little too wide. So this was all about collaboration here to truly understand the past. Remembering 
This is experimental. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure out there's an actual name for it, experimental archaeology, and it's an approach. We do this constantly. So uh, we want to show you this here uh, rolling to see how that, that did. It did pretty good. Why don't we look at the video? Hey there, I'm Ed Schultz, journeyman supervisor of the Historic Farming Trade. This is all about transporting tobacco. I'm here with Kevin Tobias, who's an apprentice farmer. I'm here also with Dan Hard. He's a coachman, an expert horseman at the Coach and Livestock Department, and our friend here, Gunner. This is a collaborative project with the Coopers who made the hogshead, the wheelwrights who made the shafts here and the fellies that are on the hogshead. Now, how do you get this thing to the tobacco warehouse? You can roll it, and that's a lot of work. Sometimes these tobacco warehouses were miles and miles away from the farmer. This is another way to do it. I wanted to give a little background on what this is all about. So what we have to do is get the hogshead to the warehouse where a government inspector inspects it. So it has to be compressed in the hogshead. That's a lot of tobacco. This right here is 10 pounds. 100 times this will be compressed in the hogshead. Every one of these leaves has to be tied in a hand like this. It's four to six leaves tied with a wrapper here. All that has to be compressed into the hogshead. Think of like a giant garlic press where it presses it slowly into the hogshead. Now that takes two men three days. Not every day you can do that. It has to be human, just like today, where the tobacco is pliable. The whole reason is you get it to the warehouse, the tobacco inspector will look at it, make sure it's good, it gives you a tobacco note, and then you can take that to a merchant, whether Mr. Prentice or whomever, and redeem it for credit and a little cash. That's how you get your stuff. All right, Kevin, go ahead and bring Gunner on over and we'll get them hitched up to our contraption here. You gotta back the horse in between the shafts. There you go. That should be good. Now that gunner's in place between the shafts, we lift the shafts up and we have a chain that comes across and it lays in the channel on the saddle and the saddle there is to protect his back. So, now he is supporting the weight of the shafts, which is not much at all. And we're going to go to the second link. We're going to hook up the britchin. The brakes are always more important than accelerating. And there we are, ready to move. Now that we've showed you how to hook up Gunner to the hogshead, let's see how it works. This is all about sharing the story of tobacco, which is critical to the economy, and especially the stories of the people that did it, both enslaved and free. We'll be rolling this down the streets, we hope, and share that story with you. That this is experimental. Paul is going to teach me how to get this thing just right. Um, there is a description there that talks about how this thing works. Just to go over this, Dan showed you in the video. This chain goes over the horse in a wood groove and fits nicely comfortable on him. And all it does is hold up the shafts here. Connected to his harness are little rings here. He walks forward 
And so the hogshead moves and rolls to the government warehouse. They're going to inspect it. It better be right. And it better be in good shape when it gets there. Remembering, remembering, folks, that tobacco is everything to these people. It's what they're all about. They think about it. They do it. It's the engine that drives the colonial economy. So uh, we showed you a bunch of videos and had a, uh, quite a, a lot of talk here. Now it's your turn to talk. What kind of questions you got? Thanks again, gentlemen. We've got a question from Susie who's wondering, you know, how many acres of tobacco are you growing to fill, fill a hogshead? That's a really good question. It depends on your age, whether you're prime labor or not. Me at 60, I'm not prime labor. Somebody between the 18 and 45 years old should be able to produce around a thousand pounds. And I can't remember if we said this or not, but mm -hmm. that's what goes into this hogshead. So this can be one labor, one person, free or enslaved, their amount of tobacco that they produce. That could be between one and three acres. If you look back at the video, you'll see we put it in hills and those hills can be three feet to six feet apart. So I can't really say acreage. I have to go by what one person could produce. So Margaret, age 12, is wondering if you could transport other materials with the hogshead. Not this specific container because the size for tobacco is specifically regulated by law, but in terms of the, the barrel shape as a package generally, yeah, barrel-shaped containers were used for transporting pretty much everything that you care to think of. That included flour and sugar, salt and rice, um, beer, wine, rum, gin, nails, dishes, all sorts of different things. Again, the big advantage of the barrel, whatever you're moving, is that you don't have to pick it up. You just turn it on its side and roll it around. Johnny wants to know, what are or were tobacco seconds? Uh, seconds. Uh, seconds are, uh, if you look back at the video, um, when we cut it, that's it, but it re-sprouts. And seconds are the regrowth from the stump that you cut off. Those are actually illegal because uh, they're of poor quality. If you put too much tobacco on the market, it's going to bring the price down and they're low quality, so it's gonna push the price down again. That's what seconds are. They re-sprout off the main stump. So when, when they're inspecting tobacco, what are they looking for? And then who's, who's gonna get in trouble if, if things aren't how they should be? Uh, again, uh, if you look back on that video, it's got this nice uh, nutmeg brown color uh, to it. It needs to look like that. If it's got green spots or wormholes, which is always the problem, yeah. it will not pass inspection. Or mold. Mold, right? White rot or black rot, as they refer to them. Exactly. And uh, black rot can be, uh, because you prized it, as in compressed it in there, when it was too high a case, too much moisture in it, it actually heats up. I made that mistake. and turns it black trash. What they'll do is if they find it, they sort through it and they burn that and there goes your income. So Tina was curious about what the cost of a hog's head would be. And I imagine she's talking about the, you know, the contents of it. Mm -hmm. And then sort of related to Tina's question, Dennis was wondering how, how is the value determined? Is it based surely on weight or are there different strains of tobacco that would have different values? Wow, that's a complex question, but uh, first, on the cost, we tend to go, I mean, this 18th century is a long time, but we try to go by insurance rates. They actually insured this on the ship. And 10 pounds sterling, English money, is what that worth is worth. Um, it, so also, um, uh, can you ask that question? Can you ask it? The second part of that question again, Bill? Um, it, what's determining the value? Is it purely weight or are there different strains of tobacco? Yeah, there are two different strains of tobacco. Uh, it's called Orinoco, which is kind of like the general tobacco. And then there's a specialty strain called Sweet Scented, and that gets better money. It was said to only grow between the York and the James River. Not really sure why, but that was probably yeah. a, a soil 
that made it. So it really affects the flavor of tobacco, I'm told, by modern farmers. So that's, that's uh, there are strains, uh, it's by weight. That's how you get your money, it's by weight. Not by quality, because it's all the same. The tobacco inspector determines whether it's good or not good, and not good is not good. Sort of related to that, I, John, is the is the hogshead itself impervious to water? Not necessarily, no. The container is made well enough to hold what's supposed to go into it. So in this case, since you're talking about squeezing several acres worth of tobacco into a, a space that's, you know, four feet high and about three feet broad, the tobacco is packed in the very tight, so the container doesn't have to be made too terribly well to keep that from leaking out. Having said that, you're not too terribly worried about moisture getting in. If the tobacco's in the warehouse or in the hold of a ship, it's protected from the weather. Uh, if it's in this position and it happens to be raining while you're rolling along, the round shape of the container means it'll shed moisture. But we do read descriptions of tobacco hogsheads being salvaged from shipwrecks where they've been floating around in the ocean for a while. And what you find is that even though some water will penetrate through the container, the tobacco is packed so tightly that the seawater only pack, penetrates an inch or two of the exterior of the tobacco. And once you cut that away, the rest of the tobacco packed in there is still perfectly good. Yep. So when somebody like Paul or Ed comes along and puts a, an axle through the center of this thing and spikes through it, you're not gonna be too, you don't think that they'd be too worried about that? Nope. Okay. Um, We've got a question from Mr. Funster, who says, you know, this is impressive, but why not just load the barrel onto a cart or even a wheelbarrow? Oh, sure you yeah. can do it. Sure you can do that. Uh, this is, we don't really know the answer to that. We do know well, that they I, use I, wagons yeah. and carts. I can tell you why well. you wouldn't put it on a wheelbarrow. And that is, again, this yeah. thing weighs half a ton Ooh. when it's packed full. So no one's picking up and pushing around a wheelbarrow with a thousand pounds in it. Um, but yeah, there is certainly evidence of uh, several hogsheads being rolled into a larger wagon. Um, there are specialized carts or drays that are made for hauling casks around. I think the big issue, and you may have more to speak to on this, uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of the smaller farmers here in Virginia is just lack of access to those kind of vehicles. It's much simpler to, to jury rig a method to, to haul it with the horse that you have available. Yeah, I or again, just roll it down the road on its own is a yeah. possibility. That's fair. That's fair. Would you, do you have anything to add, Paul? We don't have a wagon. Yeah. That'd do it every time. So we thought we'd I mean, do this because yeah. we thought it looked cool. Well, and it's it, something they did back then. So, you know, like Ed said, it's an alternative. This is not the exclusive method. Uh, this or rolling were not the two ways of doing it. This is just a way it was being done. Tatum shows actually in the engraving, that is just a portion of the engraving. The other one is a wagon yeah. where two of these hogsheads are head to head mm -hmm. um, in the wagon being pulled. So, I mean, there's lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, I think we, I know partially why I wanted to do this because it did look a little weird, uh, a little odd, and it had a historic flavor to it because we do have documentation. So it was certainly worthy of experimentation. Uh, we were actually having this conversation before filming. So, you know, we it depends on how far your farm is, is from that creek, which you can get to the river, then to the Chesapeake, and then to the Atlantic. That could be 15 miles, two days travel. It could be 300 yards. We don't really know. Uh, this is the way we do know this is a way to get it there. So I think this hogshead is empty, correct? It is. If it was packed so tightly full of tobacco, how would that impact your job, Paul, in attaching all this? Would it hold better or it would be harder to, to deal with? I think it'd be a lot easier to work with. I think the fact that it is empty uh, provides a little bit more of a challenge and uh, mm. a little anxiety towards whether the hardware is gonna hold on to this thing. Um, that pintle, that axle stub, Right now, all that's being held in place is the pressure of it going through the hole and lots of praying. 
and uh, but if it was packed with hogs uh, with uh, tobacco, I think that pressure would have pushed it out and that would have kept it mm. intact. So right now we have a, a pin, a wedge, holding that pin and preventing it from falling inside the cask. Uh, as it comes to the spikes on the fellies, um, I will be honest, I am surprised that they're still on. And I'm glad. I'm, I'm very happy that they've stayed on. I mean, I did an excellent job, and I know what I'm talking about. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. You really did. It's actually interesting. When you read Tatum's description of this, he mentions specifically that the pins that you attach the poles to are driven into the packed tobacco so that that's it's right. the, the tobacco itself that's holding those mm -hmm. pins in place. And the same same thing is true of the spikes holding the fellies on. They're driven into the packed tobacco right. as the anchor to hold them. Talk so much about growing tobacco, moving tobacco, and how this is, is done and may have been done in the 18th century. But Chris wants to know, what do you do with the tobacco you grow today? That's a really good question. I get it quite a bit. Um, today, we, we don't sell it. Um, that's not the right thing to do for an educational institution is we give it all away. We give it all away to Native Americans uh, amongst those tribes locally are the Rappahannock, Mattapamai, and uh, the Pamunkey. Um, Native Americans see this tobacco differently. They see it as a sacred object and used ritualistically. It just seems like the right thing to do. Uh, we're all about education here. That's what we do with it. So how about John and Paul, uh, in your work, obviously you're not always making stuff for Farmer Ed here. Where, where, where does most of your work, you know, end up going today? Go for it. Uh, most of our work in, in the Cooper shop does get used right here within Colonial Williamsburg, uh, in the other trade shops, in the other exhibition sites, out in the pastures around town by our coach and livestock department. We do some custom order work for other museums and then occasionally sell items to the public through the Prentice store here in town. But the vast majority of it's used right here within Colonial Williamsburg. I'd say it's about the same for us. 95% uh, of our production stays here within the historic area. And actually quite a bit of it is for it. Uh, carts, wheelbarrows, we're getting ready to build a plow. This thing, you know, that's all the kind of stuff we do. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a, a customer base for our product because you consider something as esoteric as a handmade wooden wheel. Uh, we don't get a lot of outside orders, but uh, Williamsburg keeps us exceptionally busy building and maintaining uh, the fleet that we've got in town. We do dabble in some carriage work, which is, uh, I think, everybody's immediate go-to for vehicles, but we actually don't do a lot of carriages. Wheelwrights, even historically, would have focused primarily on work equipment um, rather than the fancy stuff. Uh, we have products too, other than tobacco as well. Uh, for example, flax and cotton fiber crops, we grow those. Uh, we process the, we'll just take flax, we break it, and uh, then all that, it's called line flax, that fiber goes to the weavers. Weavers spin it and they will weave it. So it all kind of fits together. Some of our uh, things like rutabagas, which they call Swedes, uh, those go right up the road to the Williamsburg Inn and they prepare deliciousness out of them. So Christine is curious with, with the wheels being narrower than a carriage, any sense of whether that made it more difficult to move over roads that could be rutted from carriages and wagons? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you ask that again? I'm Christine not sure is ball. wondering, would this thing be- oh, this thing? Yeah, oh. be more, or something like this, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, be more difficult to move around over roads that might be rutted and you know otherwise uh, mm. difficult to pass over than let's say a carriage. Yes, I think it would. Um, you know, a, a driver of a vehicle is going to have to pay attention to the rut system. And on a road that is transporting vehicles regularly, for the most part, you're not going to see stuff that's on the road that probably wasn't built within that region, which means the 
gauge or distance between the wheels is all kind of the same. So let's envision that we're on a road uh, and the rut systems are, you know, so far. I probably would put the fellies to that distance and then it would almost, it would be a moot point. Um, I think that's probably what you're dealing with. You know, the notion of us being able to transport ourselves in a car, you know, from Georgia up to Maine on a highway where we don't have to worry about rut systems, I don't think that's the norm. Um, nor do I think people traveling great distances, the average person, it just doesn't happen. We have the luxury of folks visiting us from all over the country um, and driving here to get here. But I think the average farmer back then, he's probably only making a handful of trips in his lifetime. Most of them are gonna to be to the customs house, to town, and to church. And that's probably about it. Uh, so if you think about the vehicles that are being used, they're gonna spend more of their times within the farm than necessarily out on the road. Uh, but the wheelwrights in the various regions are gonna be working under a certain standard that kind of just through evolution have, has just evolved within. So in one area, the rut systems might be this way. Another area, the rut systems might be this. And yeah. you just kind of adapt to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hadn't really thought about that with these, but I can That's see maybe rolling it in fellies as we're doing here, you'd have more issues with the rut system than without. Yeah. Where and you don't Tatum have anything to drop into too. one of those ruts. and Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and mess up the vehicle. And that was another option, like you said, yeah. Ed, is that yeah. there, uh, Tatum does describe this apparatus without fellies on it. Um, so that it was another option that we could have gone mm -hmm. for. That would have been less work on my end. Oh, oh it was worth man. It. it was worth it. <laughs> it's okay. It's worth it. Yeah. And what about for our friend Gunner, the horse who, who pulled this? Uh, 18th century or today, I mean, is there a lot of special training that needs to go into doing something like this, or is it is it just a little bit of getting used to something that's just a little different than what they're used yeah, to? If, if he's pulled a cart before, uh, he knows what's going on. Uh, most farm work is you drag something, so he knows it's behind him. It's just a little getting used to. Uh, old Gunner, he's been through it all. He's solid, he's solid. He's seen everything here. So this is really not that big a deal. And it's not really that heavy once it gets moving, even though it's a thousand pounds, it's round. Mm -hmm. It makes all the difference. It's not skidding it along the ground. I think we have time for one final question, which is sort of what are, what are the next steps for this? I know you touched on that a little bit. Uh, what's, what, where do you hope for this to, to be in, in the future? And if, if people are coming in the near future, where, where can they see this thing? Well, we hope to have it on the streets, eventually carrying our message of how important tobacco was to the colonial economy. But we have some work to do. Remembering again, this is experimental. So uh, Paul and I have been talking about, we go into the woods with an ax in hand. We choose shafts that are longer, probably made of different material, uh, and that will get it neck down. So there's gonna be a 2.0 version eventually and if we don't get it right there'll be another one and another one but we will get this right our goal is all about sharing this and through this vehicle uh the story of tobacco and the story of you well john paul ed thank you all for sharing this with us thus far today and there's a lot of work that's gone into this um and as always this program was made possible through the generosity of our donors Thank you. To learn how you can contribute, please follow the links pinned to the comments below or join us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. Colonial uh, do you gentlemen have any final thoughts to send us on our way today? I do, uh, just real quick. This was really fun here. Uh, you know, learning is fun. Challenging yourself is fun. Uh, most of all, I think for me, it was the collaborative nature of this. Mm -hmm. All of us working together including, don't forget, coaching livestock and Dan Hard, who's expert horseman and Gunner the Horse, all four of us working together. You guys got anything to add? This is a great example of why I signed up to work here. Um, not only is the collaboration amongst different experts in their, in their field, sorry, yeah. 
but also, you know, we get to experiment. We get to play with it and all work within that that idea or the confines of the 18th century. So this is not an isolated project that we're featuring just for you guys. This is the kind of stuff that happens all the time in this